lot of heat in the kitchen with North Korea. We need to reason this thing out tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. I think uh, everyday people like us are challenged by trying to figure out whether this is a real heat in the kitchen or whether this is just rhetorical heat in the kitchen or if those are the same things. Professor Mark Janess from the New York College is here. He speaks for himself, but he's pretty, he's pretty keen on this stuff and can break it down. Um, and he's always a great go-to guy, so he and I will have this conversation shortly. I don't have a whole lot for you tonight, uh, but I did want to check in on a couple of local issues. It's great to have you on board. Thank you very much for making the choice to watch this program. Headline today locally, uh, this is, well, big time problematic. False claims probed in the UHIP mess. This is the big brain. This is the $364 million project that we have with Deloitte, the high tech company responsible for collating, coagulating, it feels like it is coagulated, stuck. Uh, the entire you know IT world for Rhode Island it's about the health care program with the health exchange it's about welfare checks it's about food stamp allocation it's about all those things and it's been about a lot of long lines and uh, a long period of time of, of what seems to be some administrative ignorance and naivete to the problem and then a recognition which came this winter uh, back in February Governor Mondo called everybody together to say I've got it to all of the employees at DHS who have been struggling with this new system and to all of the Rhode Islanders who have been struggling with the system and endured hardships because the system hasn't worked, I apologize. I apologize. I want you to know we're going to get this right. You want to get this right, right. Well, she did apologize, but at, the, at, at first glance, she explained what the situation was all about. Under Deloitte produced for us a defective system. The system they gave us was defective, Eric would say broken, um, and didn't work. We didn't get what we paid for. We paid them a lot of money, we didn't get what we paid for. And they represented to us that it was in much better shape than in fact it was. So we're litigating uh, on this whole situation, yet we're working with these folks, and it's you know, kind of a high-level dance that we're doing with Deloitte. Then comes this headline that the FBI or the feds, not the FBI necessarily, but the, uh, the, the feds are really looking into this situation um, and asking for just about every piece of paperwork and uh, factoid that's running through the system, which is most likely a mess. So this is a year away from being reconciled without some kind of legal uh, surveillance program here. I don't know where this is going to go. I, I actually, it was ironic, yesterday on the radio, I suggested that Governor Rondo has easy re-election. Why? Because I think all she has to do is get 40% in order to be able to get that done because there will be a multiple candidate field again, most likely. This thing blows up any further. She has no chance for re-election. We'll see. All right, in the meantime, I think a lot of folks are concerned about what's going on with North Korea. We've got uh, these kinds of headlines with signals Back and forth, I think it's kind of ironic that uh, Vice President Pence was literally on the front lines this week while Donald Trump was playing with an Easter bunny. Uh, the, uh, the notion, though, that we can kind of tweet or make a quick remark to a reporter as a message to North Korea, as the Washington Post headline indicates here, is kind of interesting. Uh, Donald Trump suggesting that they've got to behave. I think we have that here. Uh, in the meantime, oh, I guess we, ha we, already, we already threw both of them up. A little herky-jerky start to the program tonight, but I'll get in the game here. Uh, here's the latest. Overnight in Japan, Vice President Pence offered assurances to Tokyo and sternly advised Pyongyang not to test America's military power. But he indicated the Trump administration would still prefer to talk. And the era of strategic patience is over. And while all options are on the table, uh, President Trump is determined to achieve a peaceable resolution in the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. President Trump addressed the ongoing tensions on an interview with Fox News Monday. Have you ruled out a military strike? I don't want to telegraph what I'm doing or what I'm thinking. Uh, I'm not like other administrations where they say we're going to do this in four weeks and that doesn't work that way. We'll see what happens. I hope 
things work out well. I hope there's going to be peace. Huh. I think we all do. Indeed we do. Yes, we all do. Welcome, Professor. It's great to have you. Uh, what's your gut say about what's going on right now? That this is a dangerous situation that I hope the Trump administration ratchets down its rhetoric a bit uh, and then does some backdoor, backroom work with the Chinese to try to make things work a little smoother. You know, it's funny that you say that because I was going to I was going to ask. I, I get that everyone's got a different style, and I, I think we're we're trying to get accustomed to this new president. And you got to be open to new styles and new ways of doing business. But with a guy that seemingly is, I mean, the people are comparing North Korea's leader to our leader. I think there's no comparability there. I mean, Donald Trump is Donald Trump, but he's not the worry that Kim Jong is, right? So why taunt him? Why, why taunt him rhetorically the way it feels like it's been done so far? Well, there is a, a logical reason to do at least a, a little more well, do, aggressive do you accept, rhetoric. Do you accept my question that there's been a level of taunting going on here? No. Okay. I think what, he's, what the president is signaling is U.S. resolve to be a lot more assertive and aggressive toward North Korea than the previous administration. Got it. So you have to do that with rhetoric. Um, and then you have to demonstrate, as he did in Afghanistan and with the attack in Syria, that the administration is much more willing to use the military instrument of foreign policy, uh, again, more than the Obama administration did. This is a way to deter a potential enemy by saying that the costs are not worth the potential benefits. So in foreign policy, this is a traditional use of the bully pulpit to signal your adversaries that you are very resolved to, to, to reacting in a more assertive fashion. Yet at the, at, the, at the onset, you say they need to tone down their rhetoric. Right. Well, that's where the nuance comes in. You have to present... I don't feel the nuance. I well, feel I it more Pence with Pence on that. the road. Yes. I don't feel it at the White House. Well, there's a degree of good cop, bad cop here, um, where the, the Trump administration or the, the president himself is much more assertive, and then Pence is there going to South Korea and saying, hey, look, you know, we're not going to put up with what the pe previous administration did. However, what we're going to do is we're going to be very open to negotiations with the North with the help of China to try to ease tensions. You know, I was, ha I was f fully joking, I think, last night, and I said on the radio as well, you get this big display of military arsenal, you know, with the ho with the with the holiday in North Korea. You figure if there's any a time to get them. It's when they got everything going on in the parade. I mean, I mean, you got millions of people out there. I mean, obviously, you can, there's no Moab that's going to take everything out. But this is this is a very unusual country in that they display their 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 entire net self worth with weaponry. Oh, this is a long communist tradition. The Soviets yeah. did it, the Chinese continue to do it to this day, and even Russia actually does it on a regular day basis. Uh, May Day parades, very famous in Russia. So this is a traditional so it's not, communist. It's, it's not unique to the world. It's, no. it's, it, it's not unique to the communi communist world. It's, it's unique to us. It's unique to the West. Yeah. Although, you know, we'll run a Fourth of July parade and show some military uh, equipment and, and, and the kids get a kick out of it and the fire trucks sure. and all that kind of thing. But it's a whole different ballgame. But what is the message that, that is sent when, when they do those things? Well, the message for the parade was they were going to do an underground nuclear test that weekend. And instead, they had the parade. So for them, that's actually a moderate act uh, to try to dampen down some of the tension between the two countries but they still wanted to display their military might. Look, the only reason that North Korea survives as a state is because a generation ago, Kim Jong-un's father decided that there's no way North Korea can compete economically with South Korea. And they, there's no way that they could decentralize their economy to the extent that the Chinese did. So they went through a policy of military first. Everything in society was gonna be sacrificed for the power of the military. And that is the cornerstone of their ability to remain in power. So they can't compromise on a lot of these things because if they do, they have nothing else 
They have a horrible economy. They lost 10% of their population in the 1990s through starvation. So this is an economic basket case with nuclear weapons. That's all they have. It's not a good combination. No, it's a very unstable and dangerous combination. On the other hand, you have to you know, play with the cards you're dealt. And so far, in the last four administrations, the essential strategy the United States has pursued is a combination of appeasement and negotiation um, together with a show of force on a regular basis, or at least a show of American power. All right, when we come back, we'll talk about you know, what, if any, do we do when it comes to military action? I mean, it seems to me that uh, South Korea sits there like a sitting duck if we, if we do anything. We'll talk to Mark about that and also check into the Syria situation and the messages being sent with the Moab and Afghanistan. So lots to do tonight. Just want to remind you that if you're looking to upgrade your banking life, Navigant Credit Union can help you with that. The Card Valet app is something that you put on your smartphone and it runs not only that account that your debit or credit card is attached to, but just about everything in your banking life. It is online banking at a very high level, right in the palm of your hand. Another reason to pick up a relationship or join, as so many people have, the life's journey with Navigant Credit Union, online at navigantcu.org. Be right back. North Korea this past weekend displaying its toys Kim Jong Un. You know, here's here's what I, I don't get. I don't know anything, you know, most of us don't know anything really about North Korea, and so opining on it is kind of a, a dangerous exercise. For a country that is so completely desperate in its economy and so and so worth nothing other than its military, how do they develop the kind of intel skills and educational support to be able to literally almost be creating their own weaponry systems here without borrowing from everybody else. They're so isolated they had to do it on their own, but where do they develop the skills and how do those skills grow organically in that country? Well, it's a combination of things. The Chinese, the Pakistanis, to a lesser degree the Iranians have all assisted in missile development and nuclear development. That said, their scientists are generally educated in China. Um, and they come back and they develop their own programs. They do get covert assistance, but this is a group of individuals who are well-trained, good scientists, who are slowly developing their own indigenous nuclear force. With a crazy political mission, or is it just their administration that's hell-bent on being crazy? I don't consider Kim Jong-un crazy. I consider him evil, and there's a big difference between being crazy and evil. He is willing to starve his people, kill anyone close to him. He models himself after a Maoist or Stalin. So this is a very bad man who comes from a very bad family who's been in control of Korea for six decades, over six decades. They are willing to do what it takes to stay in power. That said, they're still rational actors. They still want to survive. And they, the reason that they have acted the way they have is because it's all about the survival of the regime at any expense, which means if they are attacked, they have a doctrine that will actually use nuclear weapons immediately. That's why using the military instrument against North Korea is so problematic. And that's why we have to look at alternative measures, like we're, we're putting in the THAAD, the anti-missile uh, defense system in South Korea. We have our Aegis cruisers on the coast with more anti-missile, and then we have that again in Alaska. So we have defense in depth against their missile systems. Plus, there is some degree of covert activity that we're playing uh, in that regime. Do you think we helped to fizzle the test? I can't say, either way. I think we helped to fizzle the test. You could say that, I couldn't possibly comment. No, but I'm guessing we fizzled the test. Uh, we have a whole lot more capability than we speak about. I hope to God we do. Because? Because, look, 21st century warfare is moving more and more towards cyber warfare. And you see this with the Iranians and the Chinese attacking American uh, national security uh, apparatus as well as the business community. So this is the future conflict. And if you're not on the cutting edge of cyber, then you're losing out in the competition, particularly because the Russians and the Chinese place so much emphasis on it. Well, uh, if we fizzled their missile, we cybered them. Uh, I think uh, 
I, I think anybody with some good instinct in that would probably know that. But the, the truth is, is that even if we took out their whole entire nuclear arsenal, if we could, if we could militarize that and strategize that, I mean, they've got non-nuclear weaponry that they can just fire at soul and end that whole city. Sure. Right? So, I mean, how many different fronts could we, I mean, if we ended up in some kind of armed conflict, A, it would be very high level, very devastating, and I don't know how you protect the free South Korean population. You can't. Um, that's why you have to stay away from this option. Look, they have dispersed their nuclear weapons. They've hardened it, so it makes it much di more difficult to take them out. You can't find them, and if you do, you have to have a direct hit. Now, we have the ability to hit them directly, but to find every possible nuclear site, that's very problematic. And then... And look, even their non-nuclear sites, and their, their, their missile capability, again, just, just... Sure. And Seoul is in the northern part of right. South Korea, right across the line. So you only have a series of, like, 20, 30 kilometers between the two, which means they have a large standing army. The North Koreans have a large standing army. They could just do a blitzkrieg right into the city. Now, South Korea has got a better military than the North. However, the North on sheer numbers would be problematic at best. Will this thing diffuse? Look, other, other than praying about it? I mean, is there, is there a path to diffusing sure. this thing? This game has been going on for over three decades for Republican and Democratic administrations alike. And what happens is the North ratchets up the tension between the two, does some missile tests, does some nuclear tests, and, and then we enter into a period of negotiations uh, in which we offer some foreign aid, they accept it, we negotiate, they break the negotiate, or actually they accept the negotiations and they cheat, uh, and then there's a period of tension again, and then we enter back into negotiations. This has happened time and time again. Well, it, does it, is it reaching an apex, or does it, is it, a, is it a, a, a cycle that can be repeated you know, until the year 3000 without any kind of worry? It's a cycle that's been repeated for over 30 years. So if you want to be optimistic, this cycle will continue. Uh, the key here is what North Korea has demonstrated is if you have nuclear weapons, You've limited the American options to containing you. And B, you can blackmail the West. And this is the great lesson from North Korea. It's the scary lesson. However, sometimes appeasing an actor like North Korea is the best of all the bad options. And I know the Trump administration doesn't want to hear the notion that you're going to appease the North, but it's worked for 30 years. Look, we called it constructive engagement when we started engaging China uh, during the Nixon administration. Um, constructive engagement is just a fancy word for appeasing, opening up markets to the Chinese. This is somewhat what we need to do with the North. If the Chinese is playing, the Chinese are playing this kind of quasi pseudo distant mediation uh, role. Do you trust them to throw them? Oh, no. The, the, the Chinese are playing this very well because whenever they want to cause the West problems, they allow North Korea to do what it's doing. Um, remember, North Korea, the only major trading market it has is China uh, with coal, oil, and more importantly, China really feeds North Korea. So if China wants to put pressure on the North, it can put a tremendous amount of pressure just by stopping trade. Donald Trump thinks he had a great uh, session in Mar-a-Lago with the Chinese president and uh, thinks he's got a good rap with him. Has he been played? Well, time will tell. Uh, again, the Chinese have played the Obama administration, they played the Bush administrations, so they're good at playing us with regard to North Korea. The big question, though, is if push comes to shove, suppose the Chinese do exactly what we want, put sanctions on North Korea. Then the question is, how does North Korea react? Because remember, the whole cornerstone of the government is its nuclear program. Will it be willing to give that up? Or will we put them on death ground in which they're willing to do anything to stop from collapsing? Because the Chinese nightmare is a collapsing North Korea. Because if North Korea collapses, then they have a massive immigration into China from North Korea, number one. Number two, they lose their buffer zone uh, with the West. If South Korea takes over the North, then it's right on their border. This isn't chess. This is... This is chicken. Level. This is chess and chicken. And then there's Syria and Moab bombs and all that. We've got a few minutes to cover the whole thing. Stay with us. This is sort of the, the ugly underbelly of all of this because there are companies 
in countries we all reside in that uh, make profit off of this sort of stuff. And, um, and one of the sort of cruelest things out of all of this that I found is that uh, for physicians, it's very difficult to understand what's going on with it, within the bodies of those who have survived these chemical uh, weapons attacks, partially because uh, a lot of these companies do not give up the exact ingredients that are in these chemical bombs because of intellectual property issues. So they don't want their, um, their competitors, for example, to know exactly what's in the chemical bombs that they're selling. Uh, so for intellectual property reasons, they don't sort of give out the, all of the ingredients. Yeah. Nargis Bajoli, a professor at the Watson Institute who studies chemical weapons and has documentaries on that, she's more or less saying that the West, the East, the Mid, the South, the North, the whatever, are all involved in the corporate chemical weapons production, which is uh, the horror show in, in Syria. Uh, we all just going through the motions here on this whole chemical weapons thing? Uh, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any world player that can inspire an intellectually honest chemical weapons conversation. The problem is as long as Russia is playing a main role in Syria, our options to either remove Assad or truly punish him for using chemical weapons are extremely limited. We made a big mistake several years ago by allowing the Russians to be a third party in negotiations. This gave Putin an opening to put in all kinds of troops back into Syria. And now he has anti-aircraft um, um, missiles. It limits our ability. That's why we use cruise missiles on our attack. So again, the last four years has been about limiting American options. And now we're in a much weaker position than we were four or five years so ago. So the 59 Tomahawks and a Moab bomb in Afghanistan um, expand our options? Well, the cruise missiles was a signal to Saad that if he uses chemical weapons, there will be a penalty be, to be played. The problem is the ultimate penalty should be the removal of Assad from office. That now is gone because the Russians are supporting Assad. And we're not willing to take on the Russians in Syria to m remove Assad. It's just not worth it for us. And our message to ISIS with a Moab bomb, was it just for ISIS? No. Uh, well, it was, look, conditions on the ground dictated the use that of that weapon. That was a weapon. tactical, purposeful right. project. Because it, it literally collapsed the tunnels that they were building. And if we hadn't collapsed those tunnels, we would have had to have gone in there with our men in hand-to-hand -hand combat, which would have been incredibly bad for us. So on its own, it was absolutely worthwhile. It was absolutely worthwhile. Now, whether it's going to resolve the problem is a whole other issue. Remember, we've been fighting in Afghanistan. This is our 16th year. And we are no better off today than we were five, ten 15 years ago. Bottom line, should people be really, really worried about the whole situation with North Korea? You should be concerned, but this is not as different as it has been in the last 5, 10, 15 years. We've had these problems. This problem of, you know, the testing in North Korea, saber-rattling, has been around for a long time. All right. Thank you. I think I feel smarter, maybe not better. <laughs> Final word when we come back. Stay with us. All righty, so uh, it makes sense for all of us to stay up on this news when it comes to North Korea. I will tell you, I, I've, I've never in my recent adult lifetime been more challenged by the complexities of understanding exactly what's going on between the Middle East and in Asia right now. Um, it requires smart citizenry, so keep paying attention. We'll see you on the radio at 3 o'clock tomorrow. I'm back here tomorrow night. Thanks for watching. Good night.